great. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and, and get to sort of take this now, you know, moving from coding variation into, into the non-coding space and discuss some of the new technologies that have been coming along in that area and, and trying to understand the, uh, the effects of non-coding genome and non-coding variants therein. So, you know, I think about this as sort of some old needs that we haven't yet solved yet. I think we've all seen this um, diagram where some, you know, huge infraction of the sort of disease-associated variation in the genome um, is really mapping to non-coding spaces where I think we're, we're behind in our ability to understand the functional consequences therein. Um, but there's also a lot of new opportunities that are coming up right now and over the next 10 years. Uh, the one that sort of keeps me awake at night is whole genome sequencing studies where the number of non-coding variants is going to dramatically expand. Um, across lots and lots of different populations, and I think if we don't keep up in our ability to understand what those variants are doing, um, we're just going to fall further and further behind over the next 10 years. There's also a lot of really exciting opportunities, I think, coming along in rare disease, thinking about new regulatory causes in some cases, um, more <coughs> often modifying loci and protective loci um, that can influence rare disease. <clears throat> and then I think as we better understand, you know, what's going on in terms of environmental responses in long-range effects between different variants and, and different target genes, there's sort of a whole swath of areas um, that I think can really benefit as we start to increase our understanding of, of, of gene function, or sorry, of function in the non-coding genome. So if we do this, and we do this really well, you know, what do we get for it? What's the significance? Um, you know, obviously we think a lot about improved diagnostics if we know better causal variants, then maybe we can, you know, better diagnose patients. Um, there's been a lot of talk at this meeting about looking at improving risk scores and how that might, for example, influence preventative measures if people are know that they're at risk for, say, diabetes or obesity. But I also think that, you know, a lot of what we can learn from non-coding, uh, the non-coding space can start to translate into, for example, pointing us to new genes that we never would have studied before that have no known function. And if we're going to really invest in those genes, you know, these kinds of, you know, understanding the, the, the sort of regulatory impacts on these genes and disease can help point us to focus on them. Um, and in many cases, those genes can then be sort of new disease mechanisms that can be actionable in the clinic. Um, and I think it's important to think, too, over the next 10 years, we're starting to see regulatory elements themselves be therapeutic targets. Uh, in, in one hand, this is common, you know, lots of drugs act by modulating gene regulation. Um, but there's also now starts, you know, new companies that are trying to develop new drugs that designed to target gene regulatory elements. There's direct editing of gene regulatory elements in cell therapies. Um, there's lots of ways uh, that, that these can be translated directly into clinical applications. And so for all these reasons, I think understanding some of the regulatory mechanisms, you know, of human disease has, has really immense uh, potential. So my talk, I'll go through kind of four areas. I'll spend most of the time talking about new technologies that have been coming along in this area over the past few years. And uh, I'll relate them to a couple examples in terms of defining regulatory mechanisms of disease and, and defining some mechanisms of environmental responses. And then I'll sum up looking at some future opportunities aggregating across lots of regions and looking at interactions between uh, variants and environments. So in terms of two, sorry, in terms of technologies, new technologies, you know, I usually think about this in the context of we're trying to fill in this uh, particular diagram. So where we are right now, we have really well documented annotation of candidate regulatory elements across the genome. We know where lots of the variants are. We know where, you know, most of the genes are. Um, we have lots of information about where in the genome these variants are somehow contributing to phenotype. And what we want to do is we want to draw this arrow and link this to mechanisms where we start to understand what are the non-coding variants effect on gene regulatory elements, how does that change gene expression, and how does that contribute to a phenotype. So one of the first things we can start to do is we can go through these annotations and start to say which of these candidate regulatory elements really have a function and are, are somehow contributing to gene expression. Um, you know, there's been lots of work on doing this in luciferase reporter assays, for example, for a very long uh, time, but, but these assays are, are more low throughput. And I think the big advance we've seen over the past sort of three to five years um, is, is a massive expanse in making these sort of low throughput luciferase reporter assays um, into a very high throughput system that can be used to measure regulatory activity across <laughs> large swaths of the genome. So I'm just highlighting a few of the different assays that have been developed, but many by uh, people in this room here. Um, but what these assays all have in common is that they basically convert what used to be a luciferase readout or a GFP readout into some sort of DNA sequence readout that we can then, uh, with high throughput sequencing, measure and use to quantify regulatory activity. 
you know, there's lots of variants of these assays, but in collection, you know, they're a really uh, quite flexible platform that I think enables a whole lot of different types of, of science uh, these days. So for example, there have been studies that we did looking at all the binding sites for transcription factors to quantitatively measure uh, their regulatory activity. There have been studies that have looked genome-wide with billions of different assays to measure the basically regulatory activity of every base of the human genome. There's been work taking synthetic variants, uh, so saturation mutagenesis for, mutagenesis, for example, custom regulatory elements. And this is, I think, an area where synthetic biology um, and, and gene regulation studies can, can go hand in hand. So as we advance our ability to synthesize DNA, we can go ahead and assay its regulatory uh, effects directly and uh, sort of a nice synergy there. You know, and these assays can even be used uh, to directly assay patient DNA. So we can take patient genomes, we can put them into reporter assays and measure the regulatory function of those patients. Um, this could be a really interesting new use for the mass massive, uh, massive uh, biorepositories, for example, uh, after a GWAS study. And so, you know, this scale, like I said, billions of assays that can be done at once now um, in parallel, combined with this flexibility, the different types of assays that are possible, um, I think really revolutionizes how we think about uh, what we can do in terms of measuring non-coding regulatory element activity. But it only gets us part of the way. You know, we can start to take these annotations, layer on a measure of function. Um, we still need to somehow connect these to, to actual genes and to phenotypes. Um, you know, there's a couple ways that this can be done. Obviously, we talk a lot about CRISPR genome editing, you know, where you can imagine going in and mutating particular regulatory elements, changing a few nucleotides and see if that changes the proteins that are bound or the, or the, or the function. Um, but what's been really exciting is the ways that this can be done now in a high throughput screening type approach. So we've already seen some examples here today, but, you know, the rough way that this works is you have, you know, your, your pool of cells. Um, you can then, you know, transduce these cells with large libraries of CRISPR-Cas9 combined with guide RNAs targeting lots of different regions. You end up with this complex mixture of cells, um, and then as you go ahead and sort these cells on a phenotype you might be interested in or a gene expression, for example, um, it's then up to you. You can then sequence the guide RNAs within these uh, different sorted populations, and you can say, okay, guide RNAs targeting a certain regulatory element are either enriched or depleted from my phenotype, and therefore probably functionally contributing to that, to that phenotype. Um, so a really elegant example of this um, that was published out of Dan, ba Dan Bauer's lab looking at the BCL11 enhancer, um, where they've done sort of a saturation mutagenesis in situ using CRISPR um, of this one particular enhancer and shown that, you know, as predicted by some previous work, you get increases in fetal hemoglobin. Um, and this is an example where this is now translating into the clinic. So Sangamo, for example, is already starting clinical trials um, to, uh, with, with cell therapy to basically use this in, in treatment of sickle cell disease. So genome editing, we may not always want to do that. There's also some, some limitations in scale there. Um, and so in parallel with genome editing, there's been a lot of advances in, in using CRISPR-Cas9 variants to modify the epigenome and do epigenome editing. The way this works roughly is instead of using the sort of CRISPR for its nuclease activity to cut the DNA, um, you instead confuse uh, to sort of a catically inact inactive CRISPR um, different epigenetic modifying domains. It could be enzymes or, or just different structural proteins. Um, and then using this, we can modify the epigenome in certain places and ask what the function of that is in terms of targeting uh, gene regulation and, and downstream target genes. So as one example, uh, you know, we published in, in 2015 taking this dead Cas9, DCAS9, fusing it to the histone acetyltransferase domain P300. And what this does is it's basically, a, you know, it'll uh, acetylate histones, for example, H3K27 acetylation. Um, when we directed this to the globin enhancer, uh, the HS2 enhancer, um, we found that we could target and increase um, expression not just of one gene, but several genes going up to 40, 50 kb away in genes that have no business, or sorry, in a cell type that has no business expressing globin. And so it allows us to sort of functionally map what are the consequences of this particular enhancer on many genes at once. What is particularly interesting uh, in terms of epigenome editing is that there's a lot of flexibility, again, in how this can be used. So many groups have developed versions that can be used for activation by fusing to different activation domains. You can fuse to different repressive domains like CRAB and LSD1 to, to repress gene expression. Um, and there's even, I'll talk a little bit, you know, new approaches to use this to drive looping and so on. So there's a whole lot of different ways that you can use this to query the epigenome and to query, you know, how different components of the epigenome are contributing to regulatory function and target gene expression. Just like CRISPR-Cas9 editing, these can be deployed in very high throughput approaches. This is an example screening for activators and repressors of HER2. Um, and, and there's many, many other examples that have been published on this.
So I think this really does quite a lot to fill in the steps. We can, I think now in a very systematic way, I think this is really exciting, go from these annotations that have been uh, developed at NHGRI for many, many years um, and start to really systematically connect them to lots of different uh, mechanisms of gene regulation and mechanisms of disease. <clears throat> but this isn't magic. It's not like we do these assays and we look at the results. You know, underlying all of this is a huge amount of statistics, a huge amount of sophistication. Oh, that's like a... Well, that's what it looks like to a lot of people anyway, it's fine. <laughs> um, you know, there's a huge amount of mathematical sophistication that has to happen in parallel. If this isn't happening hand in hand, we're basically blind. These statistics is really the, the, the sort of the, the lens through which we actually see the genome these days. Um, you know, some examples of where this is being deployed already in NHGRI, so across ENCODE, um, there are eight now functional characterization centers whose goal is to start to go through and systematically functionally characterize regulatory elements annotated by ENCODE. Um, these eight different groups are mostly focusing on specific loci with, with a whole variety of different assays, but I think that, you know, really with directed development over the next 10 years, we can start to expand these into kind of comprehensive studies where ENCODE can add to that, for example, genome-wide functional characterization across lots of different areas of the non-coding genome. So just a couple examples on the last few minutes here. So some examples of how this can be applied to determine regulatory mechanisms of the disease. And this is a study that I've been involved with where we started with, you know, a typical GWAS result. This is a, a variant on chromosome 10 associated with hyperglycemia during pregnancy. This uh, GWAS was done in 2013. By 2015, we had done through a combination of low-throughput and high-throughput reporter assays, uh, mapped regulatory variants and regulatory elements around these target, uh, around these uh, lead SNPs, um, and, and sort of identified where the regulatory variants were in the region. Um, shortly thereafter, we used epigenome editing to start to target these regions and find the target gene. What was interesting here is this pointed to this gene, pointed us to this gene HKDC1, which at the time there were three papers on. We never would have studied otherwise. There's a really great candidate target gene, hexokinase 1, just across the street, um, which we thought would be the result that we were interested in. It ends up being this other gene. And so motivated by these results, we went through a whole battery of Biochemical assays, we show that this gene actually has a biochemical function in glucose metabolism. And then we went ahead and made a mouse model, and sure enough, this mouse develops uh, hyperglycemia during pregnancy, which perfectly mimics the human phenotype. Um, I also want to highlight, this is an example where, you know, this is work that started at NHGRI and quickly developed into a collaboration with investigators that were usually funded through NIDDK. Um, and it was an example to sort of leverage the, you know, 1.5 percent of the NIH budget in HDRI to sort of go more broadly across NIH uh, programs. So this is just one example. There are many examples using similar frameworks pioneered by many of the people in this room, um, looking at type 2 diabetes, red blood cell phenotypes, genetic association in general, lipid metabolisms. Um, I think these are uh, sort of a combination of technology here that can now, is ready to be broadly systematized and expanded across, you know, thousands of GWAS that, that we haven't yet figured out what the underlying mechanisms are. You know, real quickly, we can also think about, you know, using these, using these types of approaches to look at environmental responses. So a lot of the work in my lab focuses on, on corticosteroids and cortisone, which is often used as an anti-inflammatory. And, you know, very briefly, this is a drug that acts through gene regulation, it triggers the activity of a transcription factor known as a glucocorticoid receptor. Um, and, you know, what we can do now is we can treat cells, uh, we can look and, and measure now genome-wide what are the changes in regulatory activity in response to these drugs. So this, this uh, plot here on the, you know, looks like a ChIP-seq signal. This isn't ChIP-seq signal, this is reporter activity. Um, across the entire human genome. You can see pretty clearly in the middle, um, these are, you know, time-dependent, drug-responsive regulatory elements that we can identify de novo. We can then go in with uh, epigenome editing, for example. We can start to target some of these and show effects on target gene expression. And I want to highlight here, I mean, you know, this is, we went in with a drug that we knew what it did as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, but this can be applied to lots of different environmental conditions when we don't know the mechanisms and we can, you know, we don't know what transcription factors we need to look at. We can basically treat cells however we need um, and perturb in lots of different ways and map what are the regulatory elements that are changing their activity in response to these different conditions directly. So I think there's a potential for a discovery there that, that, that hasn't yet been tapped. And then sort of in terms of future directions, where do I think uh, all this is going over the next several years? I mean, I think there's two major thrusts. As I said, I think, um, you know, we're poised for a lot of these types of studies to become really comprehensive. Um, we can start to get sort of agnostic genome-wide perspectives that can be used to inform, for example, variants that we've never yet seen. 
And I think there's a lot of work that we need to do and start to understand combinatorial effects. And here I mean combinatorial effects between variants, between variants in genes, between variants in the environment. You know, there's a whole lot of complexity in there, and I think we need to find ways that we can start to wrap our hands around that. Um, how do we do this? Well, I mean, I think there's some obvious needs to increase scale. Um, this can be done through multiplexing and, and so on. Single cell RNA-seq is starting to see a, a lot of use in this area to help us uh, massively scale up across lots of different cells. Um, there's, a, I think, a lot of potential to continue to improve the genome and epigenome modifying toolbox. I think NHGRI is a great place to, to sort of fund and drive a lot of that research. Um, there needs to be better work on delivery, et cetera. And as I said, all of this has to be paired hand in hand with statistical methods development because, you know, if you're going to do any of this work, it just demands high sophistical, statistical sophistication. This is basically how we see anything these days. And then I think, you know, as we start to get into these areas, we're going to have to think a lot about new types of study designs. What are the right kinds of controls? How do we adjust for scale and power? You know, what happens when you start to multiplex? How do we interpret false negatives? When we don't see something, does that mean nothing, something's not happening? Or do we need to develop new technology to, to, to assay these regions? And I think what can come out of this are, and I think Arez had the point yesterday, I think we can really move starting now to some new theories in biology. So theories about what is the function of the epigenome, which hasn't really been tractable to date. What are the functions of loops? You know, how do we understand cell and tissue specificity, and how often do we need to be in a very particular cell model, or can we, can we use sort of easier to handle representative models and so forth? How do we think about combinations of variants and haplotypes effects? I think all of these are areas where we can make a lot of progress in the next 10 years if we start to expand and, and build on these technologies. Thank you.